Word study. It is no, uh, no doubt in my mind that God desired to reveal Himself to us in the form of words. And He does this in two particular ways. First, through Scripture, the written Word. And second, through His Son, the living Word. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1.14 says. I don't think it is coincidence that John begins his gospel by saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now you have probably heard before that the term Word in Greek is the word logos. Does the word logos ring familiar to anybody? I'm sure it does. The logos. If I was to, to say to someone, hey brother, tell me the good word. If I was speaking Greek, I would use the term logos there to talk about the word. But it's more than that in Greco-Roman thought. In Greco-Roman thought, the word logos also noted uh, true wisdom, ultimate wisdom. And in the Greco-Roman world, that was the goal of every human being. The goal was to gain absolute and ultimate wisdom. Now, wisdom is something that we all need and something we all should strive after. It said that the Jews of the Old Testament actually did believe in a triune Godhead, even though it's not made explicit in the Old Testament. They believed that there was Yahweh, God, right? Yahweh. The Spirit, we read about the Spirit coming upon David, how the Spirit left Saul and came upon David. So you have Yahweh, the Spirit, and then you have wisdom. And so I don't think it's coincidence that John begins his gospel by saying, in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was ultimate wisdom, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now what does all that have to do with word study? Would you agree with me that words are in incredibly important? I mean, even now, I'm sitting here speaking words, and there are words on the screen that you are reading Words have meaning, and their meaning comes from context. Remember, if you learn nothing else from this class, if you learn nothing else from me as a teacher or a preacher, learn this. Jesus loves you, number one. Number two, context, context, context. Context always defines what words mean. Now, there's a number of ways to look at context. You have what is a popular way today called reader response. And that is that whatever the text means for you, that's great. But what the text means for you, it may not mean for me. So you can't tell me what the text says. I can't tell you what the text says. That comes from a postmodern society and a moral relativist society as well. Reader response is very popular today, but it's not a good way to do Bible interpretation. It's not a good way to practice hermeneutics. What we have to do is we have to look at the context of the author, the context of the text, the context of the audience, compile them together and say, what did this mean then? That's hermeneutics. And then we ask, now, based on what it meant then, what does it mean for us now? That's called exegesis. Bringing something out of the text. Bringing meaning out of the text. So as we look at word study and how to do word study... Uh, let me say one more thing before we move on. Word study does not mean we're just going to take a word and look it up in our Bible dictionary. Because Bible dictionaries, good as they are, can lead you astray sometimes. And we're going to see an example of that uh, later uh, after the first example, be the second example, uh, Lord willing, and we get there. So what is Word study. Word study is looking at how a word is used multiple places in Scripture to determine how that word should be used in your particular text that you're studying. Take, for example, the word love. Love is a very theological term, right? First John 4 tells us that God is love. Well, if love isn't a theological term, I don't know what is because love and God are joined together by an equating verb. God is love. The essence of God is love. But in our culture, we just celebrated Thanksgiving, and I could tell you right now, I love apple pie. 
Does that mean the same thing as God is love? I hope not. (laughs) No, it doesn't. And so we have to look at how the word is used in various places and then how it is used in our text. So here's our first example. I know likely none of you in here can read Hebrew. That is perfectly okay. Just trust me on this. Here in a minute, we're going to have Hebrew and Greek both. All right, so just trust me on this. I put it up here because I want you to see what's happening in the text. All right, I want you to actually see with your eyes that what I'm telling you is something that's true and something that needs to be paid attention to. Here's the first example. There's a Hebrew word, and the word is na'ar. That's how it's pronounced, na'ar. It is translated in your Bible as little boy, young lad, child. And something along those lines. My question is, based on certain passages that use that word, does it actually mean little child? Now, there are three passages that I have up here that we're going to look at. And I'll tell you briefly what they are, and then I think I have them on the screen. The first one is Genesis 37, verses 1 through 4. I actually think I have only the first two verses of that on the screen. Uh, simply because it was too long and we really didn't need verses 3 and 4 for this. This is about Joseph. Okay? So Genesis 37 begins the Joseph narrative. And so the word na'ar is going to be used to describe Joseph. Then we move to 2 Kings chapter 2 in the very last verses of 2 Kings chapter 2. And this is when Elisha calls the two she-bears out to kill 42 little boys. Do you remember this story? Makes a good VBS story. And the last one, 1 Samuel 17, one of my favorite passages in all the Old Testament, is David and Goliath. Goliath calls David a na'ar. So, let's begin. I don't know if y'all can see that. That is really small. Uh, Genesis 37, verses 1 and 2. Okay, so here's what it says. Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Billah and the sons of Zilpah and his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Okay, so this begins the Joseph narrative. Up until this point, we know absolutely nothing about Joseph. But here we know quite a bit about Joseph. This whole section, these two verses, really tell us a lot about Joseph. Jacob lived in the land where his father sojourned. So where's Joseph? He's in the land where his father sojourned, in the land of Canaan. This is the promised land. This is the land that in uh, Genesis chapter 12, God tells Abraham, you and your descendants are going to inherit this land. So this is very important. They are where they need to be. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. By the way, Jacob gets his name changed. What does he get his name changed to, class? Israel. Very good. It's his name changed to Israel. So this, Joseph is the son of Israel. So Joseph, how old is Joseph when he's out pasturing the flock? 17. It's highlighted for you. He's 17. That's very important. Because the descriptive term for Joseph is that he is still a youth. If we're reading this in Hebrew, the word youth here would be the son, or would be the word na'ar, okay? Be the word na'ar. So that's our word that we're talking about. Uh, the, the words that are highlighted in red here are the word na'ar. So he's 17 years old. So what do we know about the word na'ar to this point? Don't overthink this. Somebody young. It could refer to someone that's the age of 17 years old. Right? See how language works? It's so great. Your answer is right there. It could refer to someone who's 17 years old. That's important. Let's keep that in the back of our minds. 2 Kings chapter 2. Now, uh, this one, I'm going to unpack this a lot before we come to the problem of word study. And I think I have to in order for us to understand the function of the word in the sentence. Okay, 2 Kings chapter 2, and this begins in verse 23, right? Then he went up from there to Bethel. He is talking about Elisha. Then he went up from there to Bethel. And as he was going up by the way, young lads, the Na'arim, in plural, came out from the city and mocked him and said to him, Go up, you bald head, go up, you bald head. 
When he looked behind him and saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two female bears came out of the woods and tore up 42 lads of their number. Yep, that's in the Bible. That's what I always think when I read over this passage. This is such an interesting passage. It's only two verses. It's only two verses. But there is so much here that we have to unpack. So we've already said that the word he, the the pronoun he, is referring to Elisha. Now, tell me something about Elisha. Anything. He's a prophet. Very good. Uh, Who does he follow as a prophet? Elijah, right. Elijah does not die. How does Elijah leave this earth? In a chariot of fire, right. If you're reading this, Elijah has just been taken up in a chariot of fire. That's very important. Elisha is a prophet who trained under Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter uh, 19, at the end of chapter 19... Elijah comes across Elisha. He sees him. Elisha is plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. So how many oxen is 12 yoke, class? 24. That's a lot of cows pulling that plow. I don't know what kind of work he was doing. That's work that I don't want to think about. He is a hard worker. He needed a John Deere. That's right. But if you're going to be a prophet of God, you've got to be a hard worker. And Elijah saw that, I think. So Elijah takes his cloak off and he casts his cloak over Elisha. That was the symbol of saying, follow me. Leave everything and follow me. Elisha uh, sacrifices all 24 oxen and gives the, the meat, the flesh of those oxen to his village. And he tells his parents goodbye. And he follows after Elijah. Now, he just saw Elijah being taken up in this chariot of fire. He's a prophet of God, too. The Scriptures tell us that Elisha was actually not a bald man. He was a hairy man. And, and I have to be honest with you, I'm not going to say that anybody is uh, you know, sinning for doing this, but I see a lot of VBS and Sunday school material that depict this story. I'll never understand why we're teaching, you know, three and five year olds this particular story, but it shows Elisha as a bald man. Well, if you're a good Bible student and you under and you've read about Elisha, you know the Bible depicts him as a hairy man. So why would they call him a bald head? If he's not bald, why do they call him a bald head? Any takers? What's just happened? He's seen Elijah go up in a chariot of fire. (laughs) No, I don't think so. I think he was a very emotional person. These past two weeks, we have been at the funeral home a little more than I care to admit. And it doesn't take very long for us to see the emotion that human beings feel when someone very close to us is taken away. Now, Elijah was taken up in a chariot of fire, and that's a very glorious thing to see. Does that mean that Elisha didn't feel emotion? Well, not at all. In the ancient world, this is why historical context is so important when you read the Bible. The ancient Near Eastern world, and Oriental cultures, you don't mourn the loss of someone by going to the funeral home. You don't mourn the loss of someone by just barely shedding a tear like we do today. The Jews of the ancient Near East ripped their clothes and plucked out the hairs of their head and the hairs of their beard. Now, that's so weird for us because we would never think about doing that, but that was their culture. They're very, very expressive. And you didn't just mourn the death of someone in the ancient Near East for you know, a few days or at the funeral home. You mourned them for months. Do you remember how many days of mourning was spent for Joseph when Joseph died? Anybody remember? Seventy days. That's over two months. So what's happened here, Elisha has seen Elijah go up into heaven. He's an emotional man. He's torn the hair out of his head, literally. And these Naarim, these young lads or whatever, 
That's the question. Who are they? Come out and they're mocking him. Now you can't get away from them mocking him, but I think how they mock him is seen in a different light when we interpret what we have already. They mock him by saying, go up, you bald head. Now every time I've heard this passage taught in a Bible class or preached from the pulpit, the preacher or the teacher always says, well, Elisha got mad that they made fun of him for being bald. That's not what they're saying. They're making fun of him for two reasons. Number one, because Elijah went up and he didn't. Well, why didn't he go up? Was he not a godly person? So they're saying, why didn't you go up? We saw Elijah. Why didn't you go up? And then they're mocking him in his mourning. And if there was a cultural thing at the time that you did not do, it was to mock someone who was in mourning. So that's what's happening. Now, we read this, and not having known any of that, most of us, I'm sure, read this and say, how in the world could God let two bears come out of the woods and kill 42 little boys? Let me ask you this. How many of your Bibles translate the term lads here in a different way? Anybody's? What, are, what we got? What is it? Youths, okay. Youths. What else? Anybody else? Okay, let's go back to the first term. Young lads. Then he went up from Bethel, and as he was going up by the way, young lads came out. Does anybody say little boys? That's usually what's translated. One. Okay. In this particular passage, we have to do two word studies. First of all, we have to do uh, well, three, actually. We have to do na'ar, which is the word lads. We have to do a study on the word young, and we have to do a study on the other word lads down here. Coincidentally, the English version here, which is the New American Standard, translates this term as lads and this term as lads, but they're two different terms in Hebrew. So what do we do with that? This is why word study is so important. All right, let's start with the first word. Going up, by the way, young lads, young The word young, as it is used in this particular passage, and some of your translations say little. If we're going to be truly literal, and let me say this, this is why a word-for-word translation is sometimes not that good of an idea. Because what the Hebrew is saying literally is not what is meant literally in English. Okay? So, let's back up. The word young. The word little actually is a better translation. But here's the thing. The word little there does not denote age. It denotes experience. We might say something like novice. Okay? Keep that in the back of your mind. Then we have our million dollar word, na'ar. These novice lads, young men, whatever. And then we come down here, tore up 42 lads. This word lad in Hebrew is the word yelid, yelid, uh, which, which means uh, most commonly something like, uh, like male child, okay? Now, you say, well, Joshua, you just said it said it, it, it's a male child. It isn't a male child someone who's young. Look, I'm 26 years old. I ain't a baby, but I'm still a male child. You can ask mom and dad. See what the problem is here? When we say that a word is hard and fast to mean one thing, we are making a terrible fallacy. So we have to compare and contrast, right? So here's what the text is getting at. As he was going up, by the way, some novice young men, let's call them, came out from the city. All right, jump down here. Then two female bears came out of the woods and tore up 42... uh, Again, I don't want to use the term male child because that causes it to seem more temporal, like we're talking about age. Forty-two young men, I guess you could say here, of their number. Now, when we put these three together, we're going to come back and see that age is not what the term is denoting, but something different. 
1 Samuel 17. Then the Philistine came on and approached David with the shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy with a handsome uh, appearance. Now, how many of you have seen uh, videos, movies? I always pick on Veggie Tales, and I like Veggie Tales, but uh, how many of you have seen the, the depictions where it's like a five year old to a 10 year old kid going out to meet the giant Goliath? Right? That is a, a terrible Hollywood uh, exaggeration of what's happened. Now, what's happened is still miraculous. Don't, don't say that I'm not saying that. What's happened is still miraculous, but it's not a five year old kid. All right? So, what do we know? Well, this is the word Na'ar. Based on this word, and based on what we know about it from Genesis 37, what's the age range? Could be 17 years old. Now, how old did a man have to be to go into the military of Israel? Anybody remember? 20. You're right. 20 years old. All right? So you had to be 20 years old. Now, all of, jo- uh, all of Joseph, all of David's brothers are at battle. David is not. Why? He's not. He can't be old enough. Can't be old enough. All right? So we know, we know he's younger than 20. We know the word could depict someone who is around the age of 17. So if we're being objective, is this some 10 or 12-year-old kid? It can't be. It can't be. And by the way, you don't need the word here to understand that David isn't a 10 or 12-year-old kid because David marches right up to the king himself. And I tell you what, a 10 or 12-year-old kid did not do that. He marches right up to the king himself and says, Look here, king, I have killed a lion and a bear. I don't know of any 10 or 12-year-old kid. I know some mean 10 or 12-year-old kids. I don't know anyone who could kill a lion or a bear with a sling. Maybe y'all do. I don't. So, we look at this word. We look at what, it is, what it's used in different contexts. And, and I'll tell you two more that I didn't put up here. Um, the word na'ar is used to talk about Moses when he is two years old. Well, what does that do to our 17-year-old theory? Well, it makes it a whole lot more flexible, doesn't it? If it's used to talk about someone who's two years old. Further, the word na'ar in 1 Kings uh, chapter 20 is used to talk about the fighting men. Okay? The fighting men. When you go to 1 Kings chapter 20 and you read in your English Bibles, the word na'ar is going to be translated as fighting men. It's not going to be translated as young men or little boys or whatever because you don't send little boys out to battle. But it's the same word. All right, take all that into account. What do we learn? Well, I would suggest the first thing we learn is that the word does not denote age. It has nothing to do with age. How do I know that? Because it can refer to someone who's two years old, and it can refer to someone who's 17 years old. And by the way, I said it was used of Moses when he was two years old. It is, but it's also used of Moses when he's 90. So what do you do with that? Is there another category that this word could be used to describe besides age? What do we know about the three groups of people, if you will? What do we know about Joseph about David and about the, the novice men in 2 Kings that they all have in common. Besides that they're men and besides that they're perhaps young. Young and inexperienced. Inexperienced, I think, is the big word there. They have inexperience, but... If they have an experience, then that means that they should have experience or they should be growing in experience in some way or another, right? You can't call someone inexperienced if they should have experience, okay? Now, you're right. I'm just making a point. Each one of these individuals, as well as Moses, as well as the fighting men of 1 Kings chapter 20, all belong to a specific group, a specific category. 
These are people who are set aside for a specific purpose. Joseph is set aside for a specific purpose to go into Egypt. These young men, I personally, you can have your own interpretation. That's the beauty of hermeneutics. I personally believe these young men in 2 Kings chapter 2 are the school of the prophets. We know that there were many more prophets than what we have written down, right? Uh, 1 Kings chapter 18 tells us that Obadiah hid 100 of the prophets from Jezebel. And we don't have any of their writings, but there was 100 of them. Being a prophet didn't mean you were someone who looked at oracles and that you predicted the future. Being a prophet was that you were the mouthpiece of God on earth. Okay, so I think that these are young men who are being trained in the school of the prophets. And we know that there was a school of the prophets during the time of Elijah and Elisha. And they see this. And those of you who are teachers, you ever had a student who just thinks they know everything? To me, that seems like what's going on in this particular passage. Now you come to uh, 1 Samuel 17. David is a, is a particular a uh, group of, of person. He's going to be king. He's going to be a warrior. But it, they all go back to the time that the word Na'ar is used to describe them. They all lack experience. They're novice. All right? Now, you can be an inexperienced novice at the age of 90. So I bring this up, not to say that our Bible translations are wrong. That's certainly not the case. If you're translating literally, it's correct but to say that there is more meaning in the text that you only get from looking at how the word is used in different places. Remember what we said about using your footnotes? If you have a footnote, use it. All right? Let's look at one more. we got five minutes, and thank goodness, because uh, this one needs to be quick. How many of you believe in the virgin birth of Jesus? Good. How many of you believe that because Isaiah chapter 7 says so? Really? Okay. Isaiah chapter 7 uses the word Alma to describe the mother of this uh, young child who is going to be called Emmanuel. And you see, uh, let, well, let me go back. The, the question is, are we talking about a virgin or are we ta just talking about a young woman? In Isaiah's account, you're correct. And we'll get to that. Okay, so, but that's the question. Now, the, the LXX, what does LXX stand for, class? Septuagint, right. It's, the, uh, it's uh, Roman numerals for 70. Okay, because there were 70 tra 72 translators, roughly 70 translators who did it. Translated the uh, Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. This would have been the Bible that was common in the day of Jesus. All right, the Septuagint. So, what does the Septuagint have to say? What does the Hebrew have to say? And how does that fit into the New Testament? Well, here's the text. We're going to start here. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. We'll get to what's highlighted in red in just a moment. Here's the Hebrew text. Again, it doesn't matter if you can read Hebrew or not or if you can read Greek or not. I just want you to see the words, okay? This is the word hene. It means behold. It has a, a, a here and nowness. It's saying this is going to happen here and now. All right, that's very important. This is the Greek word idu. It means the same thing, okay, as hene. Then it says ha'alma. This uh, letter here with the little T, what looks like a T to us, it's the letter he with a comates. This is the word the. Okay, behold the Alma, the virgin, as most of our Bibles translate it. However, the word Alma never in Hebrew means virgin. It always means young woman. There's another Hebrew word that means virgin. This is not it. Now, when we talk about this, most of the time people say, well, Joshua, you're saying that the Old Testament doesn't prophesy a virgin birth. Well, listen to me. I don't need the Old Testament to prophesy a virgin birth because I know that according to Matthew's gospel and according to Luke's gospel, that Mary hadn't known a man when she got pregnant. I do not need Isaiah 7 to prove the validity of the virgin birth. So, why does your English Bible, I would guarantee almost all of your English Bibles translates Isaiah 7, as behold, the virgin will uh, become pregnant and will bear a son. Okay? Here's why. Because the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, 
uses the word parthenos. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Parthenos. Have you ever heard of the Parthenon? Who is the goddess of the Parthenon? Athena, the goddess of fertility and purity, right? Well, what is the most pure thing in the ancient world? A virgin. So the Greek translation does not use the term young woman. It uses the term virgin. Behold, a virgin will become pregnant and will bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel. And by the way, just interesting note, this is the name Emmanuel. It's two words, God with us. So, we're coming to the time of Christmas where people are going to start talking about the virgin birth of Jesus. That's wonderful. Now, I want to go back. Let me go back. Okay. I want to go back as we close to what's highlighted in red. Remember, if we're going to interpret a text and we're going to interpret a text appropriately, we have to look at the context of the author, the context of the text, and the context of the audience. Now, what we find out is that the Lord spoke to Ahaz. The Lord spoke to Ahaz. And he's saying to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. If you do your homework, you know that Ahaz said this because he's already done his homework. He's already found out what he needs, what he needs to know in a way that is not pleasing to God. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you, uh, for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Now, wait a minute. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Who is you? You is Ahaz. Here's the sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Behold, the young woman shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. This clause, these two sentences... Describe Emmanuel. So if we're looking at the text and in the context of the text, it has to be that when the prophet is saying this to Ahaz, that he has a young woman in his presence. And he says, look here, she's going to get pregnant and she's going to have a son. And you will call his name God with us because names in Hebrew had meaning. Not like our names today where they just sound pretty. They, had, they were there to remind you of something. You will call his name God with us. And here's what he's going to do. He's going to eat these curds of honey. He's going to live this life. And he is going to be an ever reminder to you that I'm with you. And you can take that for good or for bad. Now, when Jesus is born, he is a reminder that God is with us. I'm not saying this isn't prophecy. It is prophecy. What I am saying is it has to apply both to that context and to the prophetic context. 